grab hold of their hand, shake it vigorously, not viciously, and say, neighbor or neighbor. Come on, you, you, you got to be on the ball. Neighbor or neighbor. It is good to see you. God has been good to me. I know he has been good to you too. Welcome to the program tonight. All right, that should put a smile in your face. That should put a smile in your face. All right. Uh, tonight we begin, I don't know, are you hearing me properly? Could be good, excellent. Begin our, our fourth um, evening. And uh, our second to last weekend, next weekend, will be our last. Friday and Saturday will be our last two, uh, two meetings. And uh, today we are looking at why so many churches, our subject. Tomorrow we'll be looking at God will turn it around. In the afternoon we will be looking at what really happens when somebody dies. And then on Sunday evening, you can't afford to miss it, it's another family evening. We are looking at from generation to generation. So this weekend is really packed, packed solid with, with presentations, and we pray that God's Holy Spirit will certainly touch our lives, touch our hearts, and we will experience his salvation in Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. 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 So remember, you have to invite someone to come out here. Remember that because of my busy schedule and I have the entire uh, United Kingdom, Los Ireland and all of that to look after, and also overseas appointments, I will not be passing back by this church for a series like this for quite a while. So since I'm here, you might as well uh, experience it, this series of, 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 of meetings. And in, just in case you're thinking, um, but the last time I saw him, he had hair on his head. Um, it's the same old man, but I'm wearing a brand new haircut. I actually fell among barbarous men who did this. So, and I, you didn't get that. I just went over your head. I took a haircut. So I'm glad that I could shave off a couple of years from my head and, and look like this. Well, tonight... Tonight, we are going to be in for a beautiful study. No. Okay. So, what do I need to do here? Yeah, Excellent. Uh, the technical bits. Let me just say good night to those who are on Zoom as well. Uh, oh, trust that God will bless you. And at the end of our meeting tonight, we'll be doing our anointing service. I'll be anointing you and praying for you. And if, if you're not doing the anointing service and you would like to leave, then that's fine. Um, only those who will be doing the anointing service are required to, to stay uh, for prayer and for anointing. Now, I want you to, because tonight I'm teaching you. So tonight I want you to uh, get some sort of notepad, notebook. Everything is going to be on the screen. Uh, those of you at home, I want you to take notes. Because tonight I'm dealing with, with prophecy. And in order for us to understand why there are so many churches in our world today, we have to go to the Bible and understand what the prophetic word of God says. In order for you to understand why is it people choose different religions, etc., you've got to understand what a prophetic word says from the Bible. And so I'm going to be teaching you tonight from the word of God. So take your notes. Don't take my word for it. Take your notes. I'll be teaching you from history as well. Because history validates what the Bible uh, says. 
So we need to look at this very, very carefully. So our subject tonight is why so many churches? Why so many churches? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, we commit ourselves into your hands. Bless us. Take our minds and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why so many churches? Or why so many, I should say, why so many denominations? Why so many denominations? Uh, what is it about churches and denominations that are springing up around the world? Some claiming to be the true church. Some claiming that they have the truth. But according to adherence.com, and you can check this out, there are over 3,000 different denominations, congregations, uh, sects, religious bodies around the world. So it's, it's a, a whole lot around the world. And, uh, you know, so who, who tells the truth? Who's telling the truth? Who, who has the truth or who comes very close to what the Bible says? Well, let's look at history. Let's see what history has to offer when we talk about church history, we talk about four uh, basic periods of church history. Up to AD 100, we're talking about the apostolic church. So that's the apostles, the church of the apostles, the church of the, uh, of, of, of the New Testament. Um, from 8300, 100 to 300, we're talking about the early church. So that's the, the New Testament church after the apostles began to preach and then the church began to spring up around the world. Then from 8300 to 600, we talk about the age of the church fathers, like Oregon and Augustine. And, and this period basically represents the, the, the forming of the sort of Catholic church, the universal universal church. And then from AD 600 to 1600, we're talking about the medieval church or the church of the Middle Ages. You may have heard this term before, medieval, meaning Middle Ages, the church of the Middle Ages the Middle Ages. So let's see what the Bible has to offer in terms of the prophetic word and in terms of where all of these churches and all of these denominations came from. The Bible says in Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. When you look at the Bible, you will recognize that the Bible is a prophetic book. From Genesis to Revelation, it's a prophetic book where God tells us what will happen before these things would come to pass. Even the life of Jesus, I told you the other day, was written by Isaiah and, 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 and other prophets, 600, 700. Even Moses wrote about where Jesus Christ would be born a thousand years before he was born. Even David wrote about Jesus Christ before he was born, hundreds of years before he was born. So the Bible is a prophetic book. And in order for you to understand the Bible, you have to understand prophecy. You have to understand some symbolisms. You have to understand things that are not just, just apparent to the naked eye. You have to go beneath the surface. Like the, the Bible is like an iceberg, you know. You, at the top, it looks all right, but at the bottom, that's where the real depth is. And so we're going to go deep down tonight. The revelation of Jesus Christ, or the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, predicts the future of Christianity with the use of four horsemen, four horsemen. Revelation 6, 1 and 2, John is depicting what Christianity will look like in the future. As he sits there on that lonely isle of Patmos, being fed by the seagulls and serving out a sentence, a life sentence. You see, they had tried to kill John, who was the last of the apostles, by throwing him into boiling 
swimming cauldron or vat of oil, and what John was doing was just swimming around in the oil. They couldn't kill him. The more fire they put, the more the oil boiled, the more John was swimming around in the oil, they couldn't kill him. So what they decided to do was to put him on a lonely isle, the Isle of Patmos, there in the Aegean Sea, where nobody will see, nobody will have no friends, he will just be there, the birds will be his companion, and it was there that God gave him the final book of the Bible. Let me tell you something, when people try to ostracize you and People try to, to, to not keep your company, and people try to do stuff. You don't worry, because it is in those moments that God comes through for you. Somebody say that. He comes through, and he gives you a revelation. He gives you a vision. He gives you a dream. Sometimes you feel lonely. Sometimes you feel that things are not working out for you. Sometimes family deserts you. Sometimes the, the job deserts you, and work colleagues desert you. And, and sometimes even the church deserts you but God will never desert you he will always be there for you and I thank God tonight that God John went to that lonely isle of Patmos willingly and God gave him the revelation somebody say amen, amen. and so as John is sitting there uh, in his afternoon siesta he gets a vision of what Christianity will be like until the second coming of Jesus Christ and he writes and I saw when the lamb Jesus opened one of the seals, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now understand that whenever white is used in the Bible, it means purity. And whenever a general won a war, he came back riding on a white horse showing that he is victorious, that he has conquered. And so John uses imagery from his time to depict what the New Testament is all about, a conquering faith, a pure faith. How do I know this? Well, this is what the Roman writer Tertullian said. He says that you are everywhere. You are speaking of Christians. You are in our armies. You are in our navies. You are in our senate. You are in our marketplaces. You are in our universities. You are everywhere. The Christians of the New Testament were Christians who were not afraid to share their faith, even though they were persecuted. They were everywhere. Everywhere they went, they told people about Jesus Christ. I wish that I could have some Christians today who, wherever they go, they will represent Jesus Christ. I wish I can have some Christians today who, wherever they go, they will tell somebody that Jesus Christ loves them in spite of the fear of persecution, in spite of the fear of what people will say. I wish I can have some young people who are Christians today who, when they go to university, can stand up for Jesus Christ, or when they go to school, they can stand up for Jesus Christ. I wish I can have some golden age people who, when they go to these clubs or wherever they go, can say, you know what, I'm a Christian and I'm proud. You know the latest uh, statistics that came out yesterday says that, uh, that most people in England do not believe in God. That's the latest statistics that came out, that most people in England do not believe in God anymore. So this New Testament, this first horse, the white horse, was a, a, represents a conquering faith. And white, pure, a pure faith. This is how I know this. This is how I know that this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that the believers were rich in Christian graces and in good deeds. Now, you, you remember Paul writing in Romans 12, 10, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, honoring, in honoring, giving preference to one another. Now, you can remember that after the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came upon the believers, the Bible says something very specific, and you can read this in Acts 1, uh, 2, uh, uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. The Bible says something specific. It says that all the believers had everything in common. He said that the Bible says that people sold their houses and shared with everybody. You remember Ananias and Sapphira sold theirs because they wanted to be like everybody else, but they were still greedy, and they kept back. And then when they went in, they lied to the disciples, and what happened? 
They were, they, were, they were struck down dead. Why? Because they lied. Now, nobody told them to, share, to, to sell their house and to, and to give anybody anything. No, they volunteered to do that, and they said they're going to do it. They made a promise to the Holy Spirit that they're going to do it, and then they lied about it. So, you know, let, let me put this in modern language today. If every one of us here had a house, or some of us, say half of us here had a house, what they did was they remortgaged their house so somebody else could get a mortgage to buy a house. And the church is silent. That was a pure faith. They believed in helping each other. They believed in sharing their bread. The Bible says they all had everything in common. It meant that nobody went hungry. Nobody didn't have a shoe that, that didn't have a shoe didn't have one. Nobody went naked. Everybody were clothed. Everybody was fed. Everybody was taken care of. I wish today that the church of God would be like this, where everyone will be equal, where everybody can be taken care of. It was a pure faith, a pure faith. Colossians 1.23 says that the, the faith was so pure that by Colossians 1.23, in a very short space of time, Paul writes, he says, the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. In other words, the New Testament church went and preached the gospel to every nation. You remember, you remember that Thomas was martyred in India. <laughs> you know, they went preach the Ethiopian eunuch. They, they went everywhere and they preached the gospel because why? It was a pure faith. You know, can you remember when you were baptized first? Those of you who were baptized. You remember how enthusiastic you were about telling somebody about Jesus Christ. I can remember when I was baptized at the age of 15. Oh, man, I was so enthusiastic, man. I wanted to save the world. I wanted to tell everybody. By, by 15, I was baptized. By 17, I was doing my first campaign in the church. You had no mics. You had nothing. It was just bare voice. The singing, no backup tracks and all of that. It was just bare voice. And I was belling out the gospel of Jesus Christ at 17. 17 people give their lives to Jesus Christ. They're still around in the church. I see them. They're, they're now, they have children now, some of them. So they have grandchildren now. Uh, these young people have grown up. They're, they're still around every now and then in America, wherever I pass through. They, hey, Pastor, remember? You baptized me back then, way back. You know, you, it was your campaign that I got baptized way back. Then. I can't remember how I looked when I was 17. But, but you wanted to tell everybody. And then what happened? As you get older, Somehow the zeal goes. Now it's a struggle to find people to work for God. It's a struggle to find people to fill the positions in the church, to do something for God. Everybody gets busy. Everybody's taking care of their own business. I can remember I was telling the, the elders there that when, when, when I was writing GCSEs, the church needed painting. And all of us young men, we were there on the, on the scaffolding with our books by our side and our paint in our hand. We were painting and looking at our notes, trying to memorize our, our school work because we had GCSEs, but the church needed painting. Amen. Not one of us failed our exams. Amen. I can remember that we used to race on Friday afternoons from church to get home, to, see, to get to the church, to see who will get there first to start cleaning. It was a matter of boasting. I got there first, and I started cleaning the church, and we were racing from school. I walked six miles to school every day. And we're racing to get home on Friday afternoons to clean the church. We paid no janitor. Let me tell you something, and God, I've seen how God has worked over the years. I'm telling you this as I stand here today, that I have, I have never been in want because I gave God his due. And I'm a living example of what God can do when you dedicate your life to him when you're a young person. As I stand here today. I can tell you miracles after miracles in my life, what God has used me to do for his work simply because I dedicated my life to him. Amen. When you serve God, you will never fail. Amen. God will take care of you. Amen. So it was a pure gospel, a pure, that they went around and they preached. Acts 5.14 says that believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. You know, <laughs> the beauty about it is that when they started off in Acts chapter 2, they started, they said, oh, 3,000 men were baptized. 
right? They didn't come to women and children. But by the time they got to Acts chapter 4 and 5, they couldn't count anymore. One, they, they gave one other number, 10,000 or 5,000, 10,000. And then after that, they just said multitudes. There were so many, you couldn't count them anymore. People were just being added to the church, being baptized. And their motto was, we ought to obey God rather than? Amen. Say it again. We ought to obey God rather than? Amen. Rather than men. That was their motto. They ought to obey God rather than man. And then as John looked at that pure church that represented his time, his dynasty, where the disciples were so full of good works and they moved and did what they had to do, he sees another horse. And in Revelation 6, 4, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. This is now, from a pure faith, it turns now to a blood-stained faith. A red horse represents blood. The one who rides on him with a sword and is taking peace from the earth represents persecution. Now, when people like Decius and Diocletian and so on, those emperors, Roman emperors, when they saw that the Christian church was growing and that the believers, you remember, that the, in, in the Romans, according to the Romans, they considered Christianity to be a sect. And they consider Christianity to, to be what is called a religio illicita, meaning it was an illegal religion in the Roman Empire. They, they made up all kinds of stories about Christians. You know, one of the stories that they made up about Christians was that when the Christians gathered in a room for a service, they said at night, they would gather at night, and then somebody would chase a dog through the hall or wherever they are. The dog, it was, the dog would knock down the lamp that they were using for lamp, for, for light. And then all kinds of immoral, immorality things, immoral things would be done by the Christians in the darkness. That was one of the rumors that the Romans spread about Christianity. And because of all of these rumors, the, they blamed the Christians for every single thing that went bad in the society. If there was a disaster, it was because of the Christians. If it was an earthquake, it was because of the Christians. If it was famine, it was because of the Christians. And so the Christians began to be persecuted and be killed. And you have to understand the difference between Christianity and Ju Judaism. The Judaism was considered to be a, a religio licita, meaning a legal religion, because the Romans recognized that, and that's why they gave the, 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 the Jews, the, 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 the Sanhedrin, and all of them uh, leverage and power to conduct their religion. And it was only like if they went outside of that and they had rebellion that then they were persecuted. But the Jews were considered to be legal, so they were not touched in these persecutions. It was the Christians, this Jesus, who raised up this new religion. They were the ones that were persecuted, and they were the ones that were killed. And history backs this up. You read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read any Roman history book, and it will tell you about these persecutions. And so they began to kill uh, Christians, they began to persecute them, and as a result, what happened was that Christianity spreaded because they, they, they had to run for their lives, they scattered, and wherever they went to live, they took their Christianity with them. The Roman writer Tertullian noted, he says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. Why, what did he mean by this? That the more Christians you kill, the more people join the church. Amen. The more Christians you persecuted, is the more the Christianity became attractive. The more people that you exile, was the more people who join the church. And so when the Roman writer looked at what was happening, he says, you know what? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. And what happens with a seed when you plant it, it grows, right? It springs up, right? It blossoms, it bears fruits. The blood of the martyrs. And so persecution entered the church. And this time the persecution was by the Roman authorities because as far as they were concerned, Christianity was illegal. 
And so this red horse period from 180 to 323 uh, AD is called a bloodstained uh, faith period or the second seal according to what John saw. You remember that Constantine came in in 323, around that, that time, and, and he sort of joined the church at that time, and some of the, of the, the, persecution, the persecution stopped. And then John continues, he says in Revelation 6, 5 and 6, he says, when, I, when he opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, come and see. And so I looked and behold a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius. Now denarius is a penny. And three quarts of barley for denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, if a quart of wheat is going to sell for a penny, and a quart of barley is going to sell for a penny, it means that it's not good. It means that something is wrong with the product. Because you're getting something that is valuable for cheap. You know, I normally say, uh, you know, my, my wife sometimes would tell me, oh, and I like to buy cheap things. My wife would say, boy, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. <laughs> so you think about buying a suit from Primark, and I would love to buy, I'd buy the Primark, but then you go, if you buy a suit from Marks and Spence, it might last twice the time that from, from Primark. And so in the end, you might end up gaining. So they were selling what, what John is depicting here. This is prophetic language. He's saying that something is being sold cheaply. Something valuable is being sold cheaply. Therefore, hmm, beware. Something is not right. And here we find that when the black horse period comes, it comes with a compromised faith. A compromised faith. And what do I mean by this? In Acts, the disciples had already warned the brethren. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock to shepherd the church of God. For I know this, this is Paul writing, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Watch this. Also from among yourselves, men will raise up speaking perverse things. So not only people come in from outside to destroy the truth that is in the church, but people from right inside the church who like to hear all kinds of things and do, you know, there are some folk who they always say, oh, I have something new that somebody's teaching there. They don't understand the old yet, you know, but they want something new somebody's teaching there. Uh, let's go. Itching ears. Always want to find out something. Oh, somebody having some little clandestine meeting in a corner there, and they want to go there. <laughs> they don't understand yet what is in the Bible what, what they are exposed to, but they want to go find something new somewhere. Somebody always has something new. And believe you me, you know, Jim Jones, you know, David Koresh, all of these guys, these mass murderers, they always promise their followers, I'm going to teach you something new. And then they end up being killed. So Paul says, this is going to happen. And then he says, to draw away the disciples after themselves. These folk are always coming. Come follow me. Bring your tithes and offerings to me, you know. The first thing they'll say, come and let us study. Next thing they're asking you, can you make a contribution? Can you give your tithes and offerings to us? So that, you know, we want to expand the work. And next thing, the scandal happens. So Paul warned about that. And so what happened with the church, therefore, is that because of the persecution and because of what was happening, the church began to compromise its standards. So all kinds of things started to enter into the church. Salvation through Christ was replaced by the requirements of the church. So in other words, when Christ was alive um, with us and walked with us and, 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 and so on, he said, no one cometh to the Father except by by me, right? John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, salvation, there the church is saying, is not through Christ. It's through the requirements of the church. If you can pay money, you can get, you can get absolution. You, if you pay penance, you can be good. 
If you do flagations and all of these things, you are making yourself righteous. The church became very, very corrupt. Salvation was no more by the church. The church then started to appoint, you know, popes and, and pontiffs and, and all kinds of heads of organizations that allowed people to do all kinds of things. Statues uh, that were worshipped by pagans suddenly became in the church and renamed, for example, as St. Peter. If you look at this, check any history book, go into the basilica, the cathedrals. The, this, this, is a, this is a pagan statue um, that of, of, the, of the sun god, where you see the, the brightness on the top there of the, the, the sun god is right on top of the luminary, right there on top there. But they have renamed this as St. Peter. So what happened was... And I, will, and, and I will show you, I will show you all of this. The, this here, St. Peter, this was actually Jupiter worshipped by the pagans. But then renamed, renamed by the church. Now, I'm going to be saying some, some tough things tonight, but I, I don't want you to be annoyed with me. What I want you to do is just study. Look at it. Look at it for yourself. Study it. Because a lot of times people are deceived or they don't know. They are ignorant about the fact because they may have grown up in a religion. They may have grown up in a culture. They may have grown up someplace. And nobody took the time to explain to them how is it that they get there. Let me tell you something. One of the things that I do when I'm counseling couples. I just finished counseling two couples for marriage. Thank God. And one of them will be married this 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 uh, this month. Um, and then... Uh, and then later on, uh, one of the things I do with them is called a genogram. Now, a genogram is where you go back into your ancestry and you try to find patterns of behavior that are in your ancestry that might most likely come up in your family that you're trying to make. So, for example, if in your genogram, in your family, in your ancestry, 10 people died of blood, high blood pressure, most likely that is going to be something that will affect you. If in your genogram, in your family of origin, 10 people went to prison, you have got to be careful in terms of how you behave because there is something there that has a, a proclivity to violence. Now, people don't do that when it comes to church. People just accept because my father says so, my mother says so, or whatever. Study for yourself and understand. All of these statues and images came in. Exodus 20, 4 and 5 says, You shall not make for yourselves any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, is specific in the commandment, or that is in earth or beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. When you see that there are statues, people are telling you bow down to statues, bow down to images, and all of these things, they are breaking the commandment of God. And so the, the faith of this period became very compromised, diluted, watered down. That's why the John says when he looked at it, he saw that a barley, a, 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 you know, a, a quart of barley was selling for a penny. Now where could you, could you go into Asda or anywhere, even Aldi was supposed to be the cheapest, and could you buy a pint of barley for a penny? Even today? No, you can't. Because it's something valuable. As a matter of fact, could you get anything for a penny, really? A sweet? I don't know. Right? So the value is watered down. Right? Because when this power comes around, Daniel long said in 725 that they will think to change times and laws. Right? The change of the Sabbath by virtue of our authority. That's what the Roman church said. In the Apostles' Creed, and the Apostles knew which day was the day of worship because what happened was the Christians, up to that time, they worshiped on Saturday, on the Sabbath. But when the persecutions came and all of that, they wanted to distinguish themselves. And so they decided, hmm, well, let's change the day, not by God's authority, but by the church's authority. And in the Apostles' Creed, Book 7, Section 2, it says, O Lord God, and if you have, you can buy this on Amazon and, and read it. 
He says, O Lord God Almighty, thou hast created the, whole, the world by Jesus Christ and appointed the Sabbath in memory thereof. It's there. So during this age of compromise, the pagans' day of the sun replaced the Bible Sabbath or Sunday. Sunday gets its name from sun's day. When, when God made the heavens and the earth, he did not give the names to the days. It was day one, day two, day three, day four. As people began to inhabit the earth and began to worship different deities on those days, they gave the names of the days. So on the first day of the week, they worship the sun. So that's why they call it Sunday or sun's day. On Monday, they worship the moon. That's why they call it moon's day or Monday. It evolved into Monday. On Tuesday, you can go down the line. On Thursday, they worship Thor, the god Thor. So they call it Thor's day or Thursday. And that's how, and then Saturday, they worship Saturn, the planet. And that's why they call it Saturn's day or Saturday. So the name evolved over time because man placed their, the name of their god to the name of the day, the, 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 the number one, two, three, four, five. So people ask me, how do I know which day is a true Sabbath day? Which day is it? The seventh day. The Bible says the seventh day. Remember the, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. How do I know which day is the seventh day? Simply because on Saturday, the seventh day, they named it Saturday after Saturn. Saturn's day. In the development of Christianity, I told you that history will, uh, would validate what the Bible says. We are told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend a new religion to the heathen, this is what the Emperor Constantine did, very smart guy, he transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. So what he did when Constantine became a Christian and he drove his army through the river and said, I baptize, the bishop stood up on the river bank and said, I baptize thee. And his entire army just rode through the river and that was their baptism. He became a Christian and he was smart. Constantine was a politician. I don't think, well, whether conservative or Tory, I don't know who he was, maybe liberal, I don't know what he was. But he was a politician. He recognized that the empire, the Roman Empire, was breaking up. And the only way to bring the empire back together was to bring all the warring factions together. So all those who were persecuted, the Christians, the Jews, you know, everybody, bring them together. And so the heathen... Those who worship the, the, the idols and so on, and the sun god and so on, he brought him in and he said, don't worry, I'm going to transfer your god into this. So you can still see him when you come to church. He will be right there. What a political move. In the history of Eastern Church, page 184, take note of it, buy it, read it. Or to, uh, P. Stanley says, his contentine coin bore on one side the letters of the name of Christ, and on the other, the figure of the sun god. As if he could not dare to relinquish the patronage of the bright luminary. Meaning, he couldn't stay away from the sun god. He had to stay with the sun god and he had Christ. A compromised faith in this third horse period. The Bible says in Exodus 20, 11, speaking of the Sabbath day, it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. When something is blessed, it is blessed. It can't be changed. When something is hallowed, it make, means make it holy. It is set apart. When you go to the car park outside or wherever, as I'm parking at a hotel, it says disabled parking, and then other parking. The disabled parking is for people with a disabled badge. That is fixed. Now, I know some of you sometimes park there, right, because you think that there are too many empty spaces, right? All right, don't say anything. But that's for them. The Sabbath day is for God. It says, six days shall thou labor, but the definite article the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. And he has given it a double blessing. He says he's blessed it and he's hallowed it. He set it apart for worship and for himself. 
History of the Eastern Church, page 184, says the retention of the old pagan name of Dia Solis, or Sunday, is in great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. So when people worship on a different day than on the Sabbath day, what they're actually doing is they're saying, you know what, either one, we don't know why we're doing this because we've just inherited a tradition, or two, well, we don't care. One day, a day is a day, or three, just, they just don't know. They just don't know, and they don't care to know, All right? So understand this. I'm teaching you some things, some truths here tonight. Genesis 2, 3 says, and God blessed the seventh and sanctified it meaning to make it holy, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. So the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. One, two, you work. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven says God finished his work, he ended it, and he rested. Human beings want to work. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then I visit them in the hospital because they're broken down, they're, they're burned out, and God knew that. He knew what he was doing when he said, take a day and rest. And even those who worship on the sun's day, they themselves don't even keep a whole day. They just go a bit and they come back and then they go back to the farm or they go back and do whatever work it is. God says it's a 24-hour period from Friday evening to Saturday evening. Take a rest. Rejuvenate. You're going to look younger for it. Don't kill yourself. Because God did not have to rest, but he left an example for us to follow. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm teaching you some truths here tonight. Ezekiel 22, 26 says, Our priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. Uh, this is a serious text, right? God is still serious about his Sabbath day. So, from 8323 to 536, it was a compromised faith where all kinds of things entered into the church and the pagan customs and all kinds of things entered and the church became corrupt. People had to be paying penance. People had to be doing all kinds of things for salvation when Christ says that salvation is full and free. All kinds of systems were invented to keep people down. The word of God was not even read to people. It was read into, in a language that people didn't understand. It was a compromised faith, the third seal. And when he opened the book, the fourth seal, so I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of, of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. Again, death rides in the church. So follow me carefully from a pure faith, the white horse, to a blood-stained faith, persecution by the Roman authorities, to a compromised faith, the pale horse, the, the, the black horse, to a compromised faith, the black horse, where all kinds of things came into the church and the church was corrupt. Now, death rides in the church again, but this time, the death that rides in the church is the church persecuting those who are faithful to the word of God. Those who read the Bible and want to be faithful and not follow the systems of the church, that is, of papal church, the Roman church, not wanting to follow that universal church, not wanting to follow those systems because they're looking at the Bible and they're reading it for themselves, the church now begins to persecute them. Buy a copy of the Fox's Book of Martyrs and you... You have to have a good stomach to read it because of some of the things that were done to Christians by the church because they didn't want to compromise. Can I tell you some one of them? You know, it was so ridiculous. They would chain Christians together, those who didn't want to compromise, 
and they will just push them overboard to die together. They will form a ring and they will rape their children before their eyes. Read the Fox's Book of Mortals. They caught one pastor and they starved a wild uh, animal. And they starve him, starve him, starve him, and then put him on top of the pastor. And uh, then poked him, and he began to scratch and snarl. And you know what would happen there? It would be too graphic for me to describe what happened to, to that, that pastor. So death rides in the church. And power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Death rides in the church. The church is now persecuting those who are faithful to the word of God. In the centuries of Christianity, concise history, the, the book says, the new Christians were as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans, they surged into the church. Churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. The church became impotent, no power. There was nobody praying and God was hearing. There was nobody being healed. There was nothing happening. It was just a place of impotence, a place of lack of power. From the power of the New Testament Christians, where people were healed and delivered, now to a church that is powerless and paralyzed by human dogma, paralyzed by politics, paralyzed by church and state mixing, a dead faith occurred. A dead faith. The union of church and state, where the papal pontiff became the head of state, and, and kings had to bow down to him, etc. Christianity, church history says, Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity, as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed baptized paganism. This now period is what we call the Dark Ages of Christianity. The Dark Ages of Christianity. Christians who believed in the Bible and were not going to give up their faith for what the church taught were bundled off, burnt at a stake, martyred, crucified by the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you will see what I'm talking about. All kinds of traditions entered. Human dogmas, human doctrines came in. Church hierarchy, images, indulgences, penances, traditions, all of these things came in, and the church was now a dead church. Would God's truth be trodden down forever? No. The light of truth would penetrate the darkness. Just as when the children of Israel were in slavery for 400 odd years, and they, God heard their cry in those Egyptian dens, and God sent a deliverer, and Moses came to set God's people free. God heard the cry of his people as they were being burnt at a stake, as they were being trodden upon, as they were, were searching and hiding in caves from the enemy, the church that they were supposed to be a part of. Slowly, God's people began to read the word. The Bible-believing Waldenses began to study the word of God and gathered into remote villages in the countryside there of Germany um, and Italy and France, etc. These uh, are still dwellings that are there, historical dwellings where they met. These Waldensian Christians, they will study the word of God and they will uh, write out bits and pieces or tear out pieces of the word of God and they will put it into the, the lining of their children's clothes and when they went off to university or, or school or wherever they went, they will send them. They will bake them in bread and send around the place. So when you cut the bread, you cut, when you cut the physical bread, you got the living bread. Somebody say, man, praise God. 
it, God's people, the light of the Reformation began to happen. The Dark Ages were dark. The Dark Ages were a period of compromise. The Dark Ages was a period of, of, of persecution by the church. But then suddenly, God began to shine through his people. The Waldenses brought back to the world the use of the Bible, the importance of the Bible. Before this, what was important was what the church doctrine said, what the church writing said, what everything else said except the Bible. The Bible was not translated for the people. The Bible was not used in services. It was what the church said. But now, God used the Waldenses to bring back the Bible. Somebody say amen. amen. Then John Huss came up, arose. John Huss began to read the Bible, and he began to preach the gospel. And his preaching was about obedience, obeying the word of God, obeying what the Bible says. He was preaching throughout the regions. Obedience, obedience is it. Obedience. So the Waldenses preached the Bible. John Huss preached obedience. And for his preaching, they burnt him at the stake in Lake, at Lake Constance. Um, he was the one who started a revival throughout the Slovakian regions. Uh, and, and they burnt him at the stake. And as they were burning him at the stake, as the fire erupted upon him, he was heard singing. He was heard singing until his voice was no more. As he died for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church was persecuting those who were standing for the truth that is in the word of God. And so he preached obedience. And then Luther, thus Martin Luther came up. God used Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. And no matter what he tried, he could not feel saved. He could not find salvation. He tried penance. He tried flagging flagations, beating himself with, 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 to, to a bloody mess. And all of that, he tried crawling on his knees. Everything the church said that will give him salvation or give him satisfaction, and none worked. And then he went and he studied the Bible for himself. And he studied Romans 8.1. And there he read, It is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And he said, what? This isn't the word of God? This isn't the Bible? I can no longer preach the same way I preach. I can no longer be the same person that I... Then he read Ephesians 2.8. And he found out, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And Luther got up and he wrote 95 theses, 95 reasons why the church was wrong. And he nailed them on the Wittenberg, the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral in Germany. He was German. Nailed them there so that everybody could see that the church, the Roman church, was doing the wrong thing. And so Luther began to preach grace. Now, are you seeing how the congregations are developing? Are you seeing how people are coming up with different things, but it is God who is directing everybody? And then Calvin, he discovered growth in the Bible, that you must not stay stagnant, that as a Christian you must grow, as a Christian you must develop, as a Christian you must study the word of God and grow by, in grace and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Calvinites emerged from this. The Lutherans emerged from Luther and his belief with grace. And then God raised up the Anabaptists. Up to this point, nobody was baptizing. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo, which means going under and coming up, immersing and coming up. You ask any Greek person what baptizo means, if you go to Greece anytime, ask them, baptizo, baptizo, what does that mean? They will tell you going under and coming up. Up to this point, the church was practicing what they call baptism, which was not baptism, by sprinkling water. Baptizing babies by sprinkling water on them, putting water on their forehead, etc. That was not baptism. Baptism has to occur when somebody is older to understand what the Bible says. And so the Anabaptists 
came up. And they discovered in the Bible the true baptism. And they began to bring this truth now to the world. Everywhere they went preaching that you need to be baptized, to be saved. That the Bible says in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized will be saved, shall be saved. And so the Anabaptists came up. And, the, and so out of the Anabaptists came the Baptists. And then the Wesleyans came up. Or we used to call them pilgrim holiness. The Wesley, John Wesley, and the, they read the Bible and they recognized hmm, that you need to be holy to the Lord. You need to have holiness. You need to have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You need to be a holy person. And they began to preach that. So watch how God is restoring his truth from one generation to another. He's restoring his truth. He begins, the Reformation period begins with the Walden Seas. Then John John Huss came and he preached. Luther came and he preached grace. Calvin preached the, the growth in Christ. The Anabaptists preached baptism. And watch this. Everyone is adding. So the Anabaptists now, they were taking people back to the Bible, taking people back to obedience, taking people back to grace, taking people to baptism and to growth. And now Wesley came, he's taking people back to the Bible, he's taking the, the, the obedience to grace, to growth, to baptism, to holiness. So God is restoring his full truth, the truth of the word of God, so that mankind can understand that God is serious about their salvation. And he's using different people, different situations to bring back the truth that was lost in those dark ages of persecution. It is like a torch being passed on from one pioneer to another. As truth begins to develop, people's eyes begin to open, the Bible begins to be printed now in languages that people could understand, and the world is now reading the Word of God. It's no more in Latin that people can't read or whatever other language. It is now in people's English, in people's dialect, in people that they can understand the word of God. And then William Miller came up. He read the Bible and he discovered that Jesus Christ is coming. Somebody say amen. And he thought the Millerite movement came about from that, that Jesus Christ will come in 1844. And they did their calculations based upon the prophecies of the Bible and they thought that Jesus Christ will come in 1844. Well, it wasn't that. It was Jesus had a different ministry to perform in 1844. And so they went around the world. There were people preaching. Manuel Lacunza was preaching in, 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 in South America. Different people preaching around the world that Jesus Christ is coming. The Millerite movement brought back the second coming of Christ. Up to this point, nobody preached about the second coming of Christ. The Waldenses didn't. Luther didn't. Huss didn't. Calvin, Anabaptist, Wesley, none of them preached about the coming of Jesus Christ. None of them brought back people to that. But God is building. He is building. And then out of the Millerite movement, out of the Millerite, this is William Miller here, studying the word, studying the scriptures. And out of that, he discovered, if you love me, that you should keep my commandments. He discovered that Jesus Christ is coming for a people. And out of that Advent movement, out of that Advent movement, after the disappointment of 1844, when they studied and understood that Jesus was moving his ministry from the, uh, the holy place to the most holy place of the sanctuary, that he is in a different phase now where he is ministering for us and he is coming back for us. The Seventh-day Adventist church came out of this. Now let me tell you something. If you ask me who I am, I... I'm a Waldensian because I believe in the Bible. I am a Hussite because I believe in obedience. I am a Lutheran because I believe in grace. I'm a Calvinist because I believe in growth. I'm a Anabaptist because I believe in baptism. I'm a Wesleyan because I believe in holiness. I'm a Millerite because I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because this final movement that God has raised up has brought back something that was missing from all the others. The Sabbath. All of these were still worshiping on the sun's day. All of these were still uh, influenced by what the Romans did. All of these were still going on on that day. 
But the Seventh-day Adventist movement, as God explored the Bible, raised up a group of people who brought back the true Sabbath, to worship on the Sabbath day. All of these still believe, Walden sees us, Luther, Calvin, all of them believe that when you die, you go to heaven, that when you die, you're there next to the bosom of God. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says that when you are when you die, you're dead, dead, dead. You go to the ground and you wait until Jesus Christ comes, then you will be resurrected. The Seventh-day Adventist Church brought back that doctrine to the world that people can understand that their loved ones are not up there looking down at them. You could imagine if my grandmother, beautiful lady, sweet lady as she is, she is up there looking down at me. And I'm driving down the road, the highway, and a massive truck is going to come smash me. And she's seeing that. Or you could imagine the mother who has died and left her children. Or the father who has died and left his children. And the wife remarries. And the stepfather is molesting one of those. She's in heaven. She's seeing. And the stepfather is molesting one of those children. Now, what kind of happiness she will have in heaven? Has she seen that? When you die, you don't go to heaven. When you die, you go to the ground, or you're cremated, or whatever. And when Christ blows the trumpet, once you die in him, you will be resurrected, and everybody will enjoy heaven together. What do you say? Amen. That makes more sense, logical sense. Than to carry people up there and they're still seeing suffering. You can't pay your bills. You can't get off heating. You're cold and your teeth knocking. And they're there, oh my God, and they're in heaven enjoying paradise. <laughs> the Adventist church brought us back. The health message that your body is still the temple of the living God. All of these here were still eating all kinds of unclean things. All of these were still eating not taking care of themselves, smoking tobacco, doing all kinds of things. These things were not brought. But as last movement, the Advent movement, read the Bible, recognize that your body is still the temple of the living God. And you have got to take care of yourself. So you ask me, Pastor, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because I believe in the message that this body brings to the world. Building on all of these, building on all of these that have gone on before, all of these have some truth. All of them have spoken truth. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a church that brings all of this together and says, you know what? Jesus Christ is coming. Let's get ready. Let's get ready to meet him. I want to meet Jesus when he comes. Because I don't want to worship him in vain. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. No church is going to hand me a set of dogmas and say, oh, this is it. I want to see from the word of God that this is what the Bible says. You're not going to tell me to bow down to an idol and the Bible says I should not. You're not going to tell me to worship on a wrong day when the Bible already gives the day that you're supposed to worship on. I want to be obedient to God. Because I tell you this, if I'm going to God's house, I want to know that I'm on his side. If somebody's coming to your house, they want to know that they obey the rules of your house. When I go to somebody's house, I'm very careful. The first thing I do, my grandmother told me, take your shoes off at the door. They don't say, oh, pastor, come in, come in, come in, come in with your shoes. Uh-uh. Granny said, take your shoes off. Respect the house. I can't go to your house, walking with my shoes, go in your pot, take out food, Go in the refrigeration, take drink, and you will say this, Pastor, you need to see counseling. Something is wrong with you. You can't do that. If we want to go to God's house, if we want to go to where God is, if God is taking us there, we've got to obey him. We've got to do what he says in his word, because we're going to dwell with him forever and forever and forever. i got to close this up now. Sorry I took a little extra time tonight, but I needed to be slow with this so you can understand. Because one day Jesus Christ will come and he will take us to live with him forever and forever. And we cannot afford to let church authority and church councils 
take precedence over God's word. We can't afford to be praying to images when we're supposed to pray to the Holy Spirit. We can afford our salvation to be because of how we work and how hard we work, except through the grace of God. We can afford to be telling our sins to some priest, a human being just like us, when we can go directly to Christ and tell him our pains and our sorrows. We cannot afford to be worshiping on the wrong day when we should be worshiping on the right day. We cannot afford to think that when we die, we go to heaven. Well, that means the soul is immortal, it lives on and on and on. When the Bible says that the soul is not immortal, the soul that sins, it shall die. When the Bible says that death is asleep, we cannot afford to be sprinkled instead of being baptized by immersion and going under the water. We cannot afford to live our lives anyhow, to cut short our lives when there are laws of health that we need to live, we need to live by. Christ loves us and he cares for us and he wants to save each one of us. I pray tonight that all of us will be obedient to his word so that one day when he comes, we all can be saved in his eternal kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. God, tonight I know it's a hard truth that has been preached. But God, it needed to be preached. You brought somebody here tonight, somebody online. Somebody will hear this message in the future to understand these things. Because when people are ignorant, they make mistakes, they perish. But God, you want people to be enlightened by the word of God. And so tonight, I'm thankful for this message that you've given so your people can understand. Bless us, God, and take care of us. And may salvation be real to each of us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. For those of you who are not waiting for anointing service, you are dismissed. You can go. For those who will be anointed, I want you to uh, come forward. It will just be me doing it. Um, and I want you to come forward. You, one by one, you take a seat there, and I will anoint you, and then you can you can go. Can we sing uh, one stanza before we sing? Let us have a general prayer. Um, there, there's a list of people that wrote their names, but I want to ask God to to do something uh, special. Should I stop sharing now? But, Yes. Let me just give you an experience uh, before we pray and go. <laughs> Yesterday I went to the uh, Papworth Hospital in Cambridge to pray for a young man, just 17 years old, first year of his A-levels. You look at him, he's very slim. Active football, basketball, what a lot is supposed to look like and do. Yet his heart was just performing at 10%. And they're trying their best to see what they can do. The news that he gave to the family was that it looks as if they would have to do a heart transplant. Um, and then that has its own complications and all of that stuff. Now, this family reached out to me because when I was pastoring a church where the parents went to back in the day, the father was so sick, the doctors had given up. You know when they closed the curtain around you and they said, that's it, they turn off all the machines and everything, and they say, that's it? Well, that's what they did. And they called me and they said, Pastor, we need you to pray for our father. So I went. We prayed for him. I myself, while not doubting the power of God, was being very realistic about what I was seeing in front of me. I think my humanity probably kicked in. And I thought within myself that the next call I will get when I got home would be that he's dead and we'll prepare for the funeral. I had already sorted a text in my head that I will use for his funeral. I waited and I got no call. And I said, well, uh, what's happening? I was afraid to call them, except to think maybe it might be bad news. Seven days I waited, no call. 
then I plucked the courage up to call to find out how is he doing. And they said to me, uh, Pastor, um, we'll allow you to talk to him. He's sitting up here at home and he's eating, and he would like to say thanks to you for what you have done. I couldn't believe it. But this is what God does with a little faith that we have. That man lived another eight years before he finally passed away. And not eight years of suffering, but eight years of good life. Then the mother fell ill, and I had to do the same journey again. But this time I'd learned from the first one. And she recovered as well, and still alive today. And now they call me for this boy. I went there, and I prayed for him. He was in ICU for five days. They were hooked up to all kinds of machines. And when I saw the text today from the mom, while I was in the hotel room preparing to come over here, she said, Pastor, thank God. He's out of ICU, he's in the ward, and the prognosis for him is good. It's still a long journey, but he is doing 100% better than he was before. Never doubt the power of prayer and the anointing of God. The Bible says that effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'm not claiming any righteousness of my own, but God has this ability to make each of us righteous once we surrender to him and claim the blood of Jesus. And so I'm going to claim that tonight. You want to bow your heads with me. Father, as we enter into this anointing service tonight, there are those who have put down their names, and there are those who may just join. There are those who are online and couldn't be here. But I pray, first of all, that you will cleanse me from all sin. I beg God that you will go back into my past life from the time I was born, and I confess every single sin that I can remember that I've done, every lie that I've told, every inappropriate thing that I've done, every person that I've hurt intentionally or unintentionally. I prostrate myself before you as an open book tonight, God, and I pray that you will forgive me and anoint me with the power of your Holy Spirit, that as we collectively pray for all these people tonight, that somewhere there will be a miracle, there will be a healing, there will be a restoration. Bless the oil that has been provided for this purpose. Bless the vessels that will be used. And bless your people as they come forward. In Jesus' name we pray.